Hi, in this video series, uh, we will go over a new book, Clean Code. And uh, in this 10, 15 minutes, I will try to summarize some of the insights that I took out of uh, reading this book. This video is about the introduction and the chapter one of this book. In the introduction, the author does a pretty good job on explaining what is clean code, which is the title of the book. And he, he shares that clean code is equal to um, craftsmanship. And craftsmanship is, applies everywhere in every field. Similarly, even engineers, software engineers, um, if they work as a pro, they are a craftsman. And so being a craftsman was the central theme of the introduction in my perspective. And there are two aspects of craftsmanship, knowledge and its application. So you need to know some of the principles, the best practices, uh, patterns, and some of the heuristics on what is good, what is bad to uh, write good code. Similarly, you need to know like uh, how to use it. So just knowing how to write good code is not sufficient, knowing the principles and practices, because when you actually use it, you actually make a lot of mistakes and uh, only if you learn from your mistakes um, and apply the principles that's when you actually will be able to use it so there are two aspects of craftsmanship knowledge and its application so you need to know some of the best practices but at the same time you need to apply make mistakes learn from it similar to riding a bicycle you need to know what are the principles that you, of riding a bicycle that you would not fall down if you knew how to ride it well and what do you need to do, what should you not do, etc. But you will fall down even if you know all the principles. But only by practice and learning and applying, that's when craftsmanship actually comes out. And you have to really put in hard work. That was another part that was brought up by the author. This book contains three big parts. Uh, the first uh, big part is around uh, various principles, patterns, best practices, on how to write good code. The second part is going through various case studies and exercises where you can apply some of the knowledge that we have learned in part one. And the third part is the summary of all the learnings and all the heuristics on how to detect uh, bad smelly code. And, uh, and this is from all the learnings from the part two. So when you do some of those exercises, that's when you come up with some of the best practices and you actually apply them. One of the key insights for from the introduction for me is that Again, knowledge is not sufficient. You will have to use it. So as an engineer, you would have to write lots of code, review a lot of other people's code, and get your code reviewed by a lot of other senior people so that you can learn from your mistakes. And uh, you iterate, and you get better and better over time. You just keep at it. You put in lots of hard work. You learn the principles, and you get better. So that was the introduction. Going on, chapter one, there are... There are two key things that I took out of chapter one, which is the attitude of a professional. Like, uh, if you really want to go fast and do lots of things, you have to be a professional, like a doctor who treats a patient. If a patient comes and tells the doctor, saying, you know, hey, don't waste time washing your hands and doing all of the due diligence, just, just operate on me, then that's probably a bad advice. Um, but the doctor just, you know, courteously ignores the patient and does the right thing. He is a professional. He does the right thing. Similarly, as a software engineer, you would have to be a professional. Like if, if there are pressures, if there's a big backlog, if there's like, you know, you're tired, you would have to still do it well and do, do it in such a way that you would be considered as a professional. So we always need to keep the attitude of a professional when we do our work. And um, that was the key insight that I took from chapter one. In one other thing that the author tries to share in detail is that if you really want to go fast in the long term, you can only do it with good, clean, maintainable code that gets better and better over time. So overall, any code, even if it's good code, over time it rots, primarily because requirements change, um, things change, the infrastructure changes. So you would constantly have to maintain it. So if you don't maintain it and make it better and better over time, the code is going to get bad over time. So if you want to really succeed in the long term by shipping many new features and doing a lot of things, then you would have to maintain your code and you'd have to make it better and better over time. 
The second insight I took out of this uh, chapter was how do you detect what is a proxy that whether a code is good or bad? So there are five things that the author shares. Uh, if that code is maintainable and testable, meaning you can easily change it, you can add new tests and validate that uh, there are new changes are working. Uh, that's one way to detect that it's good, good quality code. One other way is productivity of engineers. How easy is it for people in the team, to software engineers in the team, to add new features? Is it taking them a long time? Are they frustrated? Are they never happy doing it? Are they you know, never looking forward to working in that code base? That's a proxy. And the third proxy is readability. Like, is it easy to read? Like, can is it just too complexly written? Maybe not takes forever for someone to get up to speed and doesn't have good documentation, comments, and and the code itself is messy, then it's it's a proxy of bad code. And then the fourth one is being crisp and clear. Like if you know you're doing one thing well in your module and your component. There's no surprises on what it does. The code is crisp and clear. And the fifth part is that it's performant and scalable, so that uh, you don't have to constantly invest in performance. So some of these proxies of clean code uh, in the first chapter, there are various uh, renowned authors who have been asked about what is clean code, and some of these things came from there. Each of them have a different perspective and schools of thoughts on you know what is good code, good code. But these are just some of the principles, right? And together they add up towards uh, becoming a code base that is good. So there will always be time pressure. There will always be time when you're tired of working, you want to get done, you have a big backlog. But remember, going fast over the long terms requires you to constantly, uh, at regular intervals, revisit um, how you want to reduce your tech debt and improve the quality of your work. You can't always do a grand redesign which has its own pros and cons as to who will do the redesign of the entire architecture when do you deprecate the old architecture etc so you, you would have to balance with constant improvement at the same time you'd also have to consider grand redesign of your systems and you have to think it well right so going fast over the long term requires that uh, we are thinking about long-term maintenance of the code, long-term productivity of engineers, long-term readability, performance, scalability, security, and all of those aspects of code. So the, all of this has a good argument to make for cost effectiveness and even professional survival, right? Like if, as a software engineer, if you don't really write good code, then first of all, you can't maintain it and uh, you can't really extend it. You wouldn't be productive, you can't get stuff done so you know it's harder for you to be productive which is which is bad for your professional survival at the same time as a manager who's leading a team it's pretty important that all of the engineers are happy and are able to get stuff done sooner and there's no issues the code is operationally maintainable and stable so that was chapter one some of the manager tips uh, that i have is do not Think of adding new staff uh, to reduce tech debt. Like, if let's say it's taking too long for people to um, add features, then it's never a good idea to consider adding more staff to reduce tech debt. Sure, you can add more staff to reduce tech debt by working on features and reducing tech debt, actually, but not just by adding more staff to work on the same features that take way too longer. So, consider never always adding new staff members for. Um, you know, reducing your tech debt. Uh, always remember that productivity over time decreases if you do not constantly improve your code base. So um, uh, over time, the developers will feel less productive. So you would have to invest in this and balance this. And the thing to do is, if you really want to suggest good quality code craftsmanship, you'd have to review lots of code as a manager. At the same time, uh, you would have to depend on a lot of your leads to provide good promises and commitments to your product partners. Don't be a stupid manager by you know, uh, not protecting your developers. It's pretty important to protect your developers uh, to make sure that they are investing for the long term. And you should always be thinking of cleaning code all the time. It's like if there's a broken window in a house. Um, people will you know, assume that this house is not maintainable, uh, it's, it's no one cares about it, so more windows will be broken. People will throw garbage at it, etc. Right? So less people will care. But if if that window was fixed, then people you know start caring, and so you'd have to 
foster the culture of caring for your code you have to foster the culture of improving your code all the time so if you see a broken window that you always regularly invest in it just imagine as a manager that your productivity of the team gets better uh, the code just gets better over time one small action at a time we can do this as managers so there was this interesting thing that's also in the book about the boy scout boy scout rule which is leave the campground cleaner than you found it similarly we could uh, I encourage our developers and team to leave our code bases cleaner than what they found it. Okay, so final summary um, for chapter one. If you really want to go fast in the long term, it's possible. But always remember that code rots if you don't invest in it. You'd have to clean it all the time, improve on your um, craftsmanship, reduce your tech debt. Uh, and, and you'd have to practice this craft, so foster this culture of craftsmanship and foster this attitude of acting and working as a pro where you do the right thing at all the time. All right? Thanks.